Greetings, and welcome back to the channel. Today we're diving into the sci-fi films of 1936. This year marked a pivotal moment in the genre's evolution, showcasing a diverse range of films. Some mesmerized audiences with their imaginative storytelling, pioneering special effects, and forward-thinking exploration of futuristic themes, space travel, and life after death. From immediate hits like Flash Gordon to underrated gems like Things to Come, these films offered glimpses into a future while reflecting the hopes and fears of their era. Plus, we'll explore three films starring Boris Karloff, along with some lesser-known films from Mexico and the United States. So buckle up for an exciting journey through the sci-fi landscape of 1936. When looking at films about space exploration made before the space race in the 1960s, we tend to think of early film efforts that were far more fantastical. But better examples are Woman in the Moon from 1929 and Cosmic Voyage from 1936. Both films brought on famed scientists as technical advisors to get the story as accurate as possible for what was scientifically known at the time. Cosmic Voyage was made as a silent film because many theaters in the Soviet Union still didn't have sound equipment. Directed by Vasily Zuravlov when he was just 32, he enlisted the expertise of Soviet rocket scientist Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, whose influence extended to leaders of the U.S. and Soviet space programs, shaping the work of figures like Werner von Braun and Sergei Kirillev. He was not only the technical advisor, but was responsible for the crafting of the miniatures for the film. Sadly, he passed away just months before its premiere and never saw the final film. Echoes of Fritz Lang's Woman in the Moon resonate throughout Cosmic Voyage, sharing story elements and character archetypes, such as the stowaway and oxygen supply mishaps jeopardizing the mission. Set in 1946, the film portrays the Soviet space program's internal strife as Professor Sadiq and his team, including his assistant Marina, embark on the first manned moon mission, overcoming challenges they achieve a triumphant return, hailed as heroes, embodying the Soviet quest for lunar exploration. Central to the film's narrative is the theme of scientific progress and academic cooperation in contrast to the militaristic space race narratives that would dominate Cold War-era science fiction. Cosmic Journey emphasizes the collaborative efforts of scientists and engineers working together to unlock the mysteries of the universe. The film was taken out of theaters shortly after release in the Soviet Union and mostly forgotten until the 1980s, so it is still gaining recognition as a part of film history. Many impressive shots utilize the miniatures of the spacecraft, the moon landscape, and the astronauts. While the wire work for depicting weightlessness occasionally lacks finesse, it doesn't diminish the overall sense of wonder. The cinematography offers a captivating glimpse into the director's vision of space travel in 1936. The film is encouraged by the Communist Party to get younger generations interested in space travel. Despite making the film for younger generations, its visuals, rooted in scientific principles, surpass the sophistication of contemporary American narratives. Cosmic Voyage is available on DVD as well as for free on YouTube and the Internet Archive. I'll link them in the description below. Before continuing with the films of 1936, if you are enjoying the content, please give the video a thumbs up and subscribe for more History of Sci-Fi episodes. Your support is what keeps this channel thriving, and I'm thankful for everyone stopping by to share the love for this amazing genre. And some breaking news. I've started a Patreon. It's a great way to support the channel, and I'll post some behind-the-scenes rantings, random thoughts, and reviews. I'll link the Patreon page in the description below if you would like to check it out. Cosmic Voyage was based on knowledge of hard science, while Flash Gordon was a space opera based on the heights of the imagination 
becoming the first large-budget American science fiction project since the failure of 1930s Just Imagine. But it's not big budget in the way you would think. It only had a production total of $350,000. Flash Gordon would become the first real science fiction serial, unlike earlier ones that were more horror or thriller, comedy or crime hybrids, mixed with speculative elements. Producers were able to keep costs down by reusing props and sets from other Universal projects, like the watchtowers from Frankenstein, statues from The Mummy, the lab from The Invisible Ray, and the rocket ships from Just Imagine. This iconic 13-episode serial from Universal Pictures was based on a 1934 comic strip by Alex Raymond. Flash Gordon was influenced by the popularity of Anthony Buck Rogers, whose story was first seen in Amazing Stories in 1928. But you can also see influences from the 1933 novel When Worlds Collide, both dealing with the threat of a planet colliding with Earth. Directed by Frederick Stefani and starring Buster Crabbe as Flash and Gene Rogers as Dale Arden as they battle the tyrannical ruler Ming the Merciless, played by Charles B. Middleton. Crab was a former Olympic swimmer turned actor who also played Tarzan as well as Buck Rogers in the 1939 serial. During an impending collision of Earth with the planet Mongo, Dr. Zarkov, Flash, and Dale embark on an escape mission. They confront Emperor Ming who forces the all-American hero into gladiatorial combat and seeks to possess the beautiful Dale. Amid Ming's tyranny, alliances form. As Princess Aura aids Flash, together they face dangers including encounters with giant lizard creatures, fire dragons, the Sharkmen, and Hawkmen. In the end, they escape back to Earth. Ming the Merciless is allegedly dead, leaving behind questions and hopes for a sequel. The costumes range from retro-futuristic to outfits that were too scandalous according to the Hayes Code. The costumes would be more modest in the Flash sequels to meet production code concerns. The charisma of the actors brings delightful campiness to this space opera. The mixing of creatures and humans, along with rocket ships, ray guns, and new worlds. It never suffers from boring action like most serials at the time, while remaining mostly faithful to the comic. It cannot be understated how much influence the character of Flash Gordon had on future filmmakers and writers. We would not have Star Wars, as well as many other space operas, without him. He influenced not only otherworldly stories, but also the superhero genre, which was about to take off. His costumes, his heroic actions, and all-American good looks would influence the creators of Superman and The Flash. The serial would inspire sequels, a syndicated television show in the 1950s, animated series, live-action series in the 1990s and the 2000s, but the most well-known portrayal came from the 1980 feature film with its great theme song. I can't play it here because YouTube would hit me for copyright. The name Flash Gordon didn't guarantee success in 1936. The magazine The Flash Gordon Strange Adventure published only one issue before folding due to low-quality writing and artwork. Flash Gordon is available on DVD, as well as for free on Rumble and YouTube. I'll link these channels in the description below. The Invisible Ray is an American sci-fi horror thriller hybrid from Universal Pictures. Former actor and journalist Lambert Hillier, who also directed Dracula's Daughter in 1936, was better known for helming westerns in the silent era. He would later go on to direct the first screen adaptation of Batman in serial format in 1943. The film features an ensemble cast led by Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi in their fourth of eight team-ups. This is also the first of three films from Karloff that we'll look at in this episode. Set in the early 20th century, the movie delves into themes of scientific discovery, moral responsibility, and the repercussions of unchecked ambition. The plot follows an astronomer played by Boris Karloff, who discovers the deadly element radium X during an expedition to Africa. 
Exposure to its radiation gives him lethal abilities, leading to a quest for revenge against his perceived betrayers. Bella Lugosi plays Felix Benedict, a scientist who is skeptical of Dr. Rook. Unlike Cosmic Voyage, the Invisible Ray doesn't take the science too seriously. Dr. Rook captures a ray through a telescope, giving you a sense that this film is more focused on the thrills than the science. Karloff and Lugosi are always fun to watch on screen together. They were supposed to work on Bluebeard before the film was scrapped, and they were given this film instead. The Invisible Ray was about $70,000 over budget. The film had some interesting moments that didn't create a cohesive whole. This was made in an era of mad scientists doing science that's not exactly realistic. Once again, Jack Pierce is back with some great makeup effects. Pierce also worked on Dracula, Frankenstein, The Invisible Man, and Bride of Frankenstein. In an era of film recycling to save cost, some visual effects shots were reused in Flash Gordon. This was one of the last horror films made by Universal in the 1930s. They would temporarily halt production due to changes in audiences' interest, as well as rising budget cost. The Invisible Ray is available on DVD if you would like to check out this Karloff and Lugosi team-up. Things to Come, a British science fiction film directed by William Cameron Menzies and adapted from H.G. Wells' novel, delves into humanity's future amidst the destruction of war and possibilities of technological advancement. If we don't end war, war will end us. Well, what can you do? Yeah. What can we do? Set against the backdrop of global uncertainty, the film's meticulous production design and groundbreaking special effects brings Wells' dystopian vision to life. The film begins in the fictional world of Everytown, a stand-in for London, on Christmas Day, 1940, where joyous carols were silenced by the outbreak of war. Over the decades, the conflict rages on, leading to widespread devastation, societal collapse, and the emergence of a deadly plague. By the 1970s, humanity regressed to a pre-industrial state, but a group called Wings Over the World arrive with advanced technology to rebuild civilization. A new world order is established and by 2036, tensions arise as some oppose the technocratic regime, sparking a conflict between progress and resistance to change. Its mixed reception upon release didn't deter its eventual cult status, influencing authors like Arthur C. Clarke, who was a fan and recommended it to Stanley Kubrick while creating 2001 A Space Odyssey. But after watching the film, Kubrick wasn't impressed. Director William Cameron Menzies was better known as a production designer, who would later work on Gone with the Wind. But this film is mainly the creation of the film's screenwriter, H.G. Wells. He wrote the novel The Shape of Things to Come in 1933 as a response to his distaste for 1927's Metropolis, saying, quote, Whatever Lang did in Metropolis is the exact opposite of what we want done here, unquote. Wells also had little regard for most film adaptations of his work, especially the various adaptations of The Island of Dr. Moreau. So this was a chance to write a screenplay and get it right, but things didn't go as planned. While the futuristic visuals would influence set design in future decades, the simple architecture and streamlined visuals juxtapose the severity of humanity's situation after a world war. The story was a turnoff for viewers who wanted escapist fare like Flash Gordon. It was only the 16th highest grossing film in the United Kingdom in 1936. With a budget of $1.5 million, it was a financial failure. The New York Times said, quote, H.G. Wells, the eminent fortune teller, had painted a pessimistic, frightening, yet inspiring picture of our next 100 years in his first film, Things to Come, unquote. The film can at times be described as majestic and prophetic. Wells predicted a world war beginning in December of 1940. He was off by only a year. The failure of the film would cause a rift between producer Alexander Korda, the director, and the screenwriter. 
each blaming the other for the film's lack of success. Arthur Bliss's wonderful film score was the first to be recorded and sold commercially. Things to Come is available on DVD and Blu-ray, as well as for free on YouTube and the Internet Archive. I'll link them in the description below. Many science fiction films of the 1930s incorporated elements of horror. Todd Browning's The Devil Doll, though not the best example of the genre hybrid, is a fun watch. Despite its initial commercial disappointment, Browning's film has gained cult status. Best known for directing Dracula in 1931, Browning, a former vaudeville performer, transitioned into a successful career as a director and screenwriter. The film was adapted from the 1932 novel Burn Witch Burn by Abraham Merritt and features Oscar winner Lionel Barrymore and Just Imagine star Maureen O'Sullivan. Paul Lavand, played by Barrymore, is wrongfully convicted of a bank robbery and murder and escapes prison with scientist Marcel, who has created a formula to shrink humans. After Marcel's death, Lavand and Marcel's widow uses the formula for revenge, disguising himself as a toy maker named Madame Mandelip. He employs tiny assassins to target those who framed him. Aiming to clear his name, the visual effects are the highlights of the film, with the use of creating miniature people and the shrinking effects. It's a kooky story that can be appreciated today for its campiness. Though most didn't like the film at the time, the New York Times gave it a positive review for the team behind the visual effects. Quote, Not since The Lost World, King Kong, and The Invisible Man have the camera wizards enjoyed such a field day. Unquote. And also adding that Lionel Barrymore in a wig and skirt has, quote, its novelty value. The Devil Doll is available on Blu-ray as well as VHS if you're old school. It's also on Amazon Prime to rent in the United States. The Macabre Trunk is an obscure Mexican sci-fi and horror film directed by Miguel Zacarias. A mad scientist conducts twisted experiments involving blood transfusions to find a cure for his ailing wife. He kidnaps a woman and brings her to his laboratory for his gruesome procedures. There is a detective on the case, bizarre comic relief, a beggar who finds some body parts, and chase scenes that seem out of a different film, blending elements of crime drama, horror, and sci-fi that are not as interesting as its premise. Due to a lack of preservation efforts, the copies available are of poor quality, but they provide a record of this early Mexican science fiction film. While I did like some of the visuals and cinematography, it's regrettable that they are not paired with a stronger narrative. The Macabre Trunk is available for free on YouTube and the Internet Archive, and I'll link them in the description below. One of my favorite films I reviewed for this episode is The Man Who Changed His Mind, a British sci-fi horror hybrid from director Robert Stevenson. Best known today for helming Jane Eyre in 1943 and Mary Poppins in 1964. Starring Boris Karloff in the second of three films in this episode. He is joined by Anna Lee, Donald Cawthrop, and John Loder. A young and beautiful scientist, Dr. Claire Wyatt, played by Anna Lee, takes a job with two eccentric scientists working on experiments to transfer human minds into other bodies. The story revolves around Dr. Lorenz, played by Boris Karloff, loses funding for his experiments and seeks revenge. After he commits murder, he switches bodies with the fiancé of Dr. Wyatt, hoping to escape a murder rap, but also to be with his beautiful assistant. Lorenz is outsmarted and suffers the consequences of his actions. This is an enjoyable and fast-paced, well-written story. Karloff and Lee work well together, and the cinematography is more sophisticated than other sci-fi films of the time. The Man Who Changed His Mind is available on DVD and for free on YouTube, and I'll link it in the description below. The Walking Dead is an American sci-fi and horror film from Warner Brothers. It is not associated in any way with the comic book or television show. 
Directed by Michael Curtiz, a prolific Hungarian filmmaker who left Europe for Hollywood in the 1920s, and would go on to direct Casablanca in 1942. The film stars Boris Karloff as John Elman, a wrongly convicted man who is executed for a crime he didn't commit. He is joined by Ricardo Cortez, Edmund Gwen, and Marguerite Churchill. Elman is given a second chance by way of the scientific experiments of Dr. Beaumont. Now revived from the dead, Elman seeks vengeance against those responsible for his wrongful conviction. As he hunts down the real criminals, he grapples with his newfound undead existence. The Walking Dead explores themes of justice, revenge, and the supernatural. What happens to the mind after death and what a scientist would do to get those answers. There is some great cinematography, especially as Karloff goes on his path of revenge. We've seen examples of bringing back the dead, such as 1935's Life Returns, but the scene in which Karloff is revived is very reminiscent of Frankenstein, even the scientist reaction. The film was a modest hit, making $300,000 on a $217,000 budget. It starts off as a gangster film, then melds with science fiction in the latter half. Ortiz gets some great performances from his actors, even with a script that could use more depth for such a profound topic. The Walking Dead is available on DVD and for free on the Internet Archive. I'll link it in the description below if you would like to check it out. I would barely describe Ghost Patrol from director Sam Newfield as science fiction. It's more of an American Western and crime drama with a sci-fi MacGuffin that kicks the plot into action. It reminds me of 1935's Airhawks, where a mysterious death ray is used to bring down airplanes. Stories like Ghost Patrol were influenced by the rise of pulp magazines at the time. Department of Justice agent Tim Caverly, played by Tim McCoy, best known for B-grade westerns, investigates a series of airplane crashes, only to uncover a plot by a criminal gang using a lethal death ray device, prompting our hero to embark on a daring mission to rescue the inventor and stop the criminal scheme. Written by Wyndham Gittins, who also wrote the Whispering Shadow serial we discussed in my 1933 episode, the story is dull and wanders. But Tim McCoy's gigantic hat is more interesting than most of the actors. Ghost Patrol is available on DVD as well as for free on Tubi TV and YouTube. I'll link it in the description below. You would think a film called Trapped by Television would involve a character getting trapped inside a television. But that's not the case in this American sci-fi crime comedy. Television technology was becoming more popular in the late 1930s with the first live sporting event broadcast in this year, as well as broadcast from the BBC in late 1936. So it didn't take long for Hollywood to start making films about the subject. From director Del Lord and starring Mary Astor, Lyle Talbot, Ned Pendleton, and Joyce Compton, Trapped by Television follows an investor as he struggles to develop new television technology amid financial constraints and bill collectors knocking at his door. His invention attracts the attention of gangsters aiming to profit from it, while a crooked businessman seeks to exploit the television invention for personal gain. Mary Astor is a strong leading lady, and Nat Pendleton is the nicest bill collector ever. The story isn't as groundbreaking as the television technology, but it is still a quick and fun watch. Trapped by Television is available on DVD, and for free on the Internet Archive and YouTube. And I'll link it in the description below. Oh, gray water heaters that install themselves. I love it. I'm riding shotgun. You are a shotgun. <laughs> you know when Mystery Science Theater 3000 spoofs a film, it must be something bad. Undersea Kingdom is an American low-budget serial sci-fi adventure that Republic Pictures desperately wanted to be the next Flash Gordon but it failed with a terrible script and flat action. Directed by B. Reeves Eason and Joseph Kane. 
The serial stars Ray Corrigan, known for his westerns and stunt work. Corrigan also wore a gorilla-type suit in chapters 8 and 9 of the Flash Gordon serial that we discussed earlier in this episode. The story follows naval officer Crash Corrigan and his companions, including a young reporter, as they search for sources of a series of earthquakes, leading to the discovery of the lost underworld kingdom of Atlantis, ruled by the tyrant Unga Khan. Corrigan and his allies work to thwart Unga Khan's plans for world domination, encountering robots, fierce adversaries, and fantastical creatures along the way. The robots are cute, but not menacing, and the set design isn't bad. I found myself enjoying the Mystery Science Theater episodes, but they only cover the first two chapters of the serial. Undersea Kingdom is available on DVD as well for free on the Internet Archive and YouTube, and I'll link them in the description below. I'll also link to the Mystery Science Theater episodes for your enjoyment. This was a period of transition in science fiction literature. The time of H.G. Wells and Jules Verne, who introduced foundational themes within the rapid technological advancements of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, was about to give way to the dawn of a golden era of science fiction in a few short years. In 1936, the fanzine Nova Terra was founded by a group of British science fiction fans who wanted an alternative to American pulp magazines. It would be renamed New Worlds in 1939. Jack Williamson's novel The Cometeers was serialized in Astounding Magazine and later published in novel form in 1950. It's the story of Bob Starr and his companions as they bravely challenge the mortal danger of the Cometeers, a race of powerful alien beings. First published in 1936 under John Wyndham's pen name, Stowaway to Mars is about a British pilot in a race against the Russians and Americans to get to Mars. The Other Side of Here by Murray Leinster, initially printed in Astounding Stories in 1936 as The Incredible Invasion and later released as a novel in 1955, chronicles an invasion from the fourth dimension. One science fiction work published this year, beyond its influence on the genre itself, found its way into the world of feature films or television, either as direct adaptations or as sources of inspiration for future cinematic sci-fi adventures. War with the Newts by Carol Chopek is a satirical story where mankind's exploitation of intelligent newts backfires, sparking a rebellion. This commentary on human greed shows our failure to anticipate the repercussions of our actions. The story was adapted into stage plays, a BBC radio adaptation, and a podcast. As of 2023, a Czechoslovakian film adaptation is in development. Nineteen thirty-six was a year marked by significant upheaval around the world. The continuing rise of fascism in Europe and growing tensions would soon lead to another world war. There were also major strikes from those demanding better wages and working conditions. Franklin Roosevelt won his second of four terms as President of the United States and continued to enact the New Deal programs to get Americans back to work. And since no part of history exists in a vacuum, culture, history, science, and the arts are influenced by as well as influence the course of history. Therefore, when looking at science fiction films of any time, it is important to understand what else was going on in the world. And so for the rest of this episode, I'll look at a snapshot of events that occurred in 1936. The completion of the Hoover Dam on March 1st provided vital flood control and hydroelectric power, reshaping the American Southwest. German occupation of the Rhineland once again violated treaties, including the Treaty of Versailles, exacerbating international tensions. France and Britain did little to halt German rearmament, which would eventually lead to war. Benito Mussolini's conquest of Ethiopia began in 1935, and Italy annexed the country on May 7, 1936, after defeating the Ethiopian forces. The Spanish Civil War began on July 17, when conservative military leaders 
led by Francisco Franco, rebelled against Spain's left-wing government. It turned into an international showdown with Nazi Germany and fascist Italy backing Franco's forces, while the Soviet Union and volunteers from other countries, including the United States, supported the government side. Beginning on August 1st, The 1936 Summer Olympics in Berlin served as a key platform for Nazi propaganda, with Jesse Owens challenging Aryan supremacy by winning four gold medals. The Berlin Olympics broke new technological ground as the first major sporting event to be televised. Specialized viewing rooms were set up around Germany for the public. In the Soviet Union, Stalin's Great Purge, beginning in October, initiated a period of political repression of opposing intellectuals and military leaders. Contrasting with this was the anti turn pact between Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan to combat the spread of communism. Meanwhile, turmoil engulfed the British monarchy following King George V's death in January and Edward VIII's abdication in December due to his controversial romance with divorcee Wallace Simpson. This ushered in King George VI's reign by the end of the year, with future Queen Elizabeth II as heir presumptive. The cultural landscape of this time was marked by several events and developments, some of which carry a lasting impact into today. The Green Hornet made its debut as a radio show on January 31st on WXYZ in Detroit featuring the crime-fighting exploits of newspaper publisher Britt Reed and his alter ego, the masked vigilante known as the Green Hornet. The Phantom debuted on February 17th as a daily newspaper comic strip created by Lee Falk. Phantom would be adapted into a live-action serial in the 1940s, an animated series, as well as a feature film in 1996. While traveling through California in March of this year, photographer Dorothea Lang captured one of the most famous images ever, Migrant Mother, featuring Florence Owens Thompson and her children, showing the struggle of migrant farm workers during the Great Depression. Photographer Robert Capa's iconic image, The Falling Soldier, taken on September 5th during the Spanish Civil War, captures the moment a gunshot strikes a soldier. However, its authenticity has been questioned, with debates arising over whether it was staged rather than a genuine portrayal of combat. On November 23rd, the first issue of Life, a popular weekly magazine, was first published. Lastly, the scientific and technological discoveries and events of 1936. June 26 saw the debut of German engineer Heinrich Volke's creation the Foka Wolf FW61, which achieved the distinction of being the world's first fully controllable helicopter. Alan Turing published on Computable Numbers on November 12th, introducing the idea of the Turing machine, setting the stage for the field of computer science and laying the groundwork for the computers we use today. The Jet Propulsion Laboratory was founded as part of the California Institute of Technology. Its establishment marked the beginning of a legacy in space exploration, with JPL later becoming a key NASA center. And finally, on November 2nd, the BBC unveiled the world's first regular high-definition television service, High Definition by 1936 standards, using both the Baird and Marconi EMI systems, ushering in a new era of global communication, The BBC also debuted three regular programs, Picture Page, Starlight, and Theatre Parade. During Hollywood's golden age, major studios like MGM, Paramount, Warner Brothers, 20th Century Fox, and RKO had significant control over filmmaking. However, the industry prioritized dramas, comedies, and musicals over science fiction leading to limited big-budget investment in the genre. Renowned director Fritz Lang, known for classics like Metropolis and Woman in the Moon, made his Hollywood debut in 1936 with Fury, starring Spencer Tracy and Sylvia Sidney. The film centered on a man wrongly accused of a crime, 
delves into themes of mob mentality and vigilante justice, showcasing Lang's signature dark visual style and dramatic lighting, which would later influence film noir. Additionally, the industry mourned the loss of Irving Thalberg, the influential producer behind MGM's successes, who passed away on September 14th at the age of 37 from pneumonia. Thalberg's legacy includes producing acclaimed films featuring stars like the Marx Brothers, Greta Garbo, Joan Crawford, Clark Gable, and his wife, Norma Shear. The Great Siegfeld was a huge hit for MGM, making $4.6 million on a $2.1 million budget. This biographical musical depicts the life of Florence Ziegfeld, his rise to fame, and the extravagant production of the Ziegfeld Follies. The film went on to win three Oscars in seven nominations, including Best Picture, Best Actress for Louise Rayner, and Best Dance Direction. Frank Capra won the Oscar for Best Director for Mr. Deeds Goes to Town, and Paul Muni won for Best Actor for the story of Louis Pasteur. The Academy also added two new categories for Best Supporting Actor and Actress. Unfortunately, there were no science fiction film nominees this year. Some popular films released in 1936 include Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times, Audiences follow the tramp struggles in a modernized world through a series of misadventures, including a nervous breakdown and being mistaken for a communist. He teams up with a young woman to navigate an ever-changing and indifferent modern society in one of Chaplin's best films. Mr. Deeds Goes to Town, directed by Frank Capra, depicts the story of a small-town poet who inherits a fortune and moves to New York City where his naive but genuine kindness leads to unexpected challenges and conflicts. San Francisco, a musical drama directed by W.S. Van Dyke, is about the events surrounding the 1906 earthquake and starred Clark Gable, Jeanette McDonald, and Spencer Tracy. It was one of the year's biggest hits. After the Thin Man, also directed by W.S. Van Dyke, is a sequel to the popular the Thin Man, starring Myrna Loy, William Powell, and James Stewart. This murder mystery comedy continues the adventures of Nick and Nora Charles. James Whale, best known for Frankenstein and the Invisible Man, completely changed genres in 1936 and directed Showboat. This adaptation of the Broadway musical showcased the lives of performers on a Mississippi River showboat while tackling themes of racial prejudice and social issues. Most of the sci-fi films of 1936 took steps forward visually, though storytelling ranged from simplistic to preachy. The genre, except for Flash Gordon, did little to make waves in 1936, and the rest of the pack was overshadowed by standard Hollywood fare of the time. Thanks to modern viewing technology, we can appreciate these stories from the past that try to look to the future. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for more History of Sci-Fi content, and I'll see you in 1937.